So we are moving to two services in five weeks. So we start our countdown, five weeks. So Sunday, December 3rd is our Connection Point Family Christmas. We usually do two services there. And it's going to be at 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. So what times? Yeah, so it's a little bit of a mouthful. 9 a.m., 10.45 a.m., so two services on that Sunday for a Connection Point family Christmas. And then basically, we're just not going to look back. We're just going to keep going with two services. Why? Because there's getting to be lots of people in here. And so we want to keep making room for more people to be a part of the church and what God's doing here. And so we'll go to two services. And as part of that, I would like to encourage you, we had a Serve Others Fair a month ago, yeah, about a month ago, And a number of you said, I'd love to be a part of Sunday mornings, dedicating my Sunday mornings to God by attending one and serving one. And so what that looks like is somebody has in their heart a passion to say, you know what? I just want to be the third grade teacher in first service. So I'm going to come to first service, be the third grade teacher, and then I'm going to attend the second service. Or somebody says, you know what? I love greeting people and I love to stand at the D door. So I'm going to go, this is A, this is D. I still have that in my mind mixed around. I love to greet at the A door, so I'm going to greet the A door in second service, so I'll come to first service, and then I'll be a greeter second service. So if you'd like to do that, I encourage you, find somebody in a welcome shirt, they can give you some direction on how you do that, Um, but just want to encourage you, dedicate your Sunday mornings to God, and dedicate it to your spiritual growth, and dedicate it to the service of others, and just see what God does through your life through that. Uh, But five weeks, so we're going to continue to tell you the countdown until we get there to encourage you um, to be a part of what's happening on Sunday mornings at Connection Point. Now, I do want to ask you some questions this morning, and it's probably going to bring up some competitive uh, comparisons, and that's okay. We're okay with that in church. So if I were to ask you this morning, is Apple better than, do you believe Apple is better than PC? What would you say? Yes? How many would say PCs are better than Apple? Yeah, people are going to start arguing in church. How many would say Pepsi is better than Coke? I believe Pepsi is better than Coke. I believe Coke is better than Pepsi. Wow. Some Coke lovers here. I believe Ford is better than Chevy. Wow. I believe Chevy's better than Ford. We've got quite a mixed group. Don't fight in the parking lot after church this morning. How many believe Purdue is better than IU? (laughs) Let's bring some unity to the crowd. Oh, man. The reason I bring these things up is what I have found is belief. What you believe leads to faith. You put faith in something. So here's what I mean by that. Because you know Purdue is a great education, you believe Purdue is a great education, you put faith in the education you get and you receive from there. Does that kind of make sense? In other words, faith follows belief. So because you believe, you know what? We got farmers in here. How many believe John Deere is better than Case? Anybody? Oh, we got a few. Any, <laughs> the deer family. <laughs> That's awesome. Anybody believe Case is better than John Deere? All right, so. So let's say you thought John Deere was better. So because you believe John Deere is better, you're going to put faith in that farm equipment to do your farm. Does that kind of make sense? So in other words, belief leads to faith, or faith follows belief. But now let me kind of turn our attention to something that's, you know, a little bit more worth putting our faith in, because in the end, your Apple computer will fail you. Your car, you know, is going to eventually fail. You, the farm equipment eventually quit, you know. So I want to talk about faith in the one thing that will never fail us. Faith in God. I want to talk about extraordinary faith. That what we need in this life that we're living is we need to have extraordinary faith in something. And there's only one thing that won't fail us. So what I want to do as we continue our series in Luke this morning is to look at, in Luke chapter 7... I want to answer the question, how do we cultivate extraordinary faith? How do we create an environment where faith can grow? That's what I want to examine, and and Luke chapter 7 helps us with that this morning. So if you have your Bibles, I hope you do. If you don't have a Bible with you today, they are underneath the seat in front of you. You're welcome to take that as a gift from the church. We want everyone to have access to God's Word. And I want to take a look at Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. I'm also going to invite you to stand for the reading of God's word today. So Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. The reason we stand is simply out of reverence for the fact that God gave us his word. We're so thankful. I think about the early church 
and how they would get a letter here or there. You know, Paul would write them. But here we hold all of it. What a joy that we get the entirety of God's word. And so we just, out of respect for that, want to stand for God's reading of his word this morning. So Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now, a centurion had a servant who was sick, and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, He marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Amen. These are the very words of God. You may be seated this morning. So we are working through the New Testament book of Luke. If you're new to the church... This is the way we intend to study the Bible, going through entire books at a time. In fact, I've already shared with the staff what is my 30-year preaching plan. So don't be surprised by this. I'm a planner. Going through Luke, learning all about Jesus. And then we're going to continue in the second volume, which is Acts. So Luke writes Luke and then Acts. So we'll get into Acts, which is all about the early church. So we'll start going through Acts. And then every time Paul writes a letter, we're just going to pause and we'll go through that letter. So if you're wondering what we're going to study the next 30 years, you now have the answer. We're just going to look at the entire New Testament. But we study a book at a time. That way we don't miss anything. The entirety of God's word has value and we want to know the whole thing. So that's where we're headed. We want to look at every book. Jesus has been teaching and healing. This is where we're at. So obviously God sent his son. And now we're in a part where he's teaching, he's healing, he's performing miracles, dealing with troubled people, casting out demons. He's been essentially kicked out of his hometown, Nazareth. He went, if you go back to Luke chapter 4, he preaches a message in the synagogue. They really didn't like what he had to say because it confronted them a bit. So they want to throw him off a cliff. He walks through the crowd and then he sets up home base in Capernaum. So if you were in Israel, you go to the northern part where the Galilee is. Nazareth is kind of off in a mountainous part. But Capernaum, it's interesting the location, it goes right along a trade route. So it put Jesus in kind of the middle of it all in Galilee. And so that's where he set up shop now. People in this town, they could fish in the Galilee. They could farm on the hillsides or on the plains. So this is where Jesus is at now. And our narrative this morning begins after Jesus, he's just finished sharing his king's speech. So we were talking about his king's speech. He basically goes on a mountaintop. He prays all night, really important decision. He selects the 12 people that he's going to pass this information off to. And then he goes down and he shares with them what is like their ordination service, their commissioning service. And there's a lot of other people there too to hear what he has to say. So now he's finished with that speech. He's coming back into Capernaum where he has set up base. And this is where we find ourselves. And what he does is he approaches a situation where there's a man who's sick. He's suffering. He's near death. And the writer of this book, Luke, he's a doctor. So this is his medical prescription. He's interviewed these people. He understands the sickness this man had. And so when we look at the gospel today, we're understanding it through the lens of Luke doing research. Now, before we answer the question, how you cultivate extraordinary faith, I'd like to first say that sin, sickness, suffering, which ultimately culminates in death, this is not part of God's original plan. I think we miss that sometimes. 
when God finished his work of creating the heavens and the earth, when he created man and woman. In Genesis 1.31, here's what God says. Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. That was God's original design. Everything was great. We didn't need locks on our homes. We didn't need airbags. We didn't need 911, hospitals, police, soldiers. We didn't need any of that because that was not God's original plan. There was no sickness. There was no sin. There was no suffering or death. Everything God made was good. And then Adam and Eve, we fall short. We sin due to the evil inclinations of our heart. And now what we have today is an imperfect world full of imperfect people who desperately need faith in God. And that's why I want to look at this passage today, and I want us to examine the extraordinary faith that we can have in him. So let's be honest with the world that we're in, but also let's examine it through the lens of Christ and say we can have extraordinary faith because he came. And so with that as our background, let's examine how you and I can have extraordinary faith. And the first way is this, that you can cultivate extraordinary faith by believing in other people. I don't know if you've considered that. You can cultivate extraordinary faith by believing in other people. So we have several characters involved in our narrative this morning. A centurion, a servant who is sick. Of course, we have Jesus. We have respected Jews. We have friends of the centurion and a crowd that's following Jesus. There's lots of characters in this narrative. And now since the centurion is the central character of our passage, what I'd like to do is help, uh, help you understand what is a centurion. We need to know what that is. And a centurion basically means the commander of a hundred. So he's a military leader. A man's man. A guy's guy. A dude's dude. Right? That's what a centurion is. And I mention this because oftentimes in Christianity, Jesus can be portrayed as a perfect fit for women and children. Right? Well, we look at the story today, and the centurion encounters Jesus, and he's taken back by him. You know, men, they battle in sports, in business, in education. There's lots of ways that, that men are geared. John Eldred uh, wrote a book some years ago, Wild at Heart. It's a great book. And it talks about who guys are. And what we see in this guy is that there's a picture of this man, this Roman soldier, a warrior. He's a guy who goes into battle and he leads other men. He was affluent, prominent, and well-known. He was successful. He works for the Roman government and they're essentially overseeing, oppressing the Jewish people. But what's interesting with this man's man as he doesn't take advantage of the Jewish people. He, by all accounts, cares for those people that he has oversight for. We find this Roman centurion, someone considered to be an enemy of the Jews, to be held in high regard by the Jewish community. The centurion developed a good reputation from people of other backgrounds. And what did he do? He built a synagogue in Capernaum. And some of you could be asking the question, is all of this true? Is it real? In other words, as we look at the Gospel of Luke, as we look at the Bible, you can ask the question, is it legitimate? Are the stories in it true? Was there a place called Capernaum? Was there a synagogue there? Was there really a man who was sick that Jesus made well? And I can tell you, it's all true. The Bible's not philosophical, it's historical. We need to understand that the stories in this book are absolutely true. In fact, I can show you. So we went to Israel with a bunch of people in June, and here's some pictures of Capernaum. While the scripture was being read this morning, I had a, a scrolling view of some of the pictures of Capernaum, and I want you to focus on these three in particular. The first one talks about Jesus, or Capernaum, the town of Jesus, because why? Jesus moved from Nazareth to Capernaum. And then what you see there in the lower right is a white synagogue, so this is from the fourth century. But what's really interesting is you look at the picture, the larger picture, there's a sign there that says 4th century synagogue and the foundation stones below it. Do you see a different color? Those are basalt rocks. And it says this was the synagogue of Jesus, the foundation rocks. So when we talk about this story this morning, what's incredible to me is you can go to a town that we know as Capernaum, we can look at these foundation stones, and who laid those foundation stones? The centurion. The guy we're reading about this morning, you're looking at the stones that he put in place. Isn't that amazing? What we know in this book is that this is true. And we've got proof of it through archaeology today. Those are the stones your eyes are looking at are 2,000-year-old stones that this, this centurion laid for a synagogue for Jesus. It's amazing. So yes, this story is true. 
The, the centurion built the synagogue displaying the respect that he had for the Jews. The Jewish elders, in turn, they displayed great respect for the centurion. The relationship that they had it overcame the cultural and ethnic barriers of their day. The centurion had great faith, and this included faith that he had in people. The centurion had faith in people. In fact, this whole narrative took place because the centurion, he held a servant, a slave, in high regard. So he held someone of very different socioeconomic status in high regard, and that's how we have this narrative today. He valued someone of this different status, and so he had faith in people. And as we continue working through Luke, we're going to find how Jesus responds to people as well. He values men, women, children. People who hold various occupations, people of different ethnic, socioeconomic, and cultural backgrounds. And so this centurion models what we find in the life of Jesus as we keep moving through the Gospel of Luke. Someone who appears to be a lover of all people. Someone who has a great respect for others. So he gives us a vivid example as we go through the king's speech. You can find it in Luke chapter 6 and in Matthew chapter 5. And there's a passage, a, when we, we preached a couple of weeks ago or spoke about how we're to love our enemies... And when you look at Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus says, love your enemies, here's the reason he gives for doing so. This is in Matthew 5, 43. He says, for he, talking about God, makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So what Jesus is saying is you love your enemies. Why? Because God does. He sends sunshine and rain to every person on this earth because everybody has value. He sends sunshine and rain to men, to women, to children, to the homeless and to the wealthy. He sends it to bankers, lawyers, and teachers. He sends it to Americans, Iranians, Kenyans, and North Koreans. There's no one outside of the sight of God. They're all made in God's image. And this is what it all comes down to. Your neighbor has been made in the image of God. Your work colleague has been made in the image of God. Your relatives have been made in the image of God, not in the image of Satan like some of you would believe. Come on now. Everyone's made in the image of God. You are made in the image of God. The Walmart clerk who checked you out last week is made in the image of God. The server who served you dinner, if you went out to a restaurant last week, they're made in the image of God. The refugee who's had to flee their home in Syria has been made in the image of God. And when we understand that, we understand the inherent value that every person has in this world. We're all made in his image. That's why we can be a lover of all people. Knowing we're all made in his image, it should help us to hold in high regard every other person we interact with, everyone we get to talk to. Cultivating extraordinary faith includes developing faith in others. When you get lunch today and you interact with that server, understand they're made in his image. When you go get groceries this week and you're interacting with the checkout clerk, in fact, let me say this. Instead of going to the self-checkout line, go talk to a human. Go greet them by name. It's written right there. Greet them like the human that they are. Hold them in high regard. It's incredible when you interact with people and that they see in you that you hold respect for them the way that it lifts them up. May we hold people in high regard. You can cultivate extraordinary faith by believing in people. And you can cultivate extraordinary faith by believing you have been blessed to be a blessing. You can cultivate extraordinary faith by believing you've been blessed to be a blessing. The centurion was obviously a person of some means. He paid for a synagogue to be built. So he had some resources. And he used his power and wealth in ways as to not to use people but to bless them, to serve them. The centurion used his resources and power to the benefit of those around him. By the world's standards, our country is filled with wealthy people. They are. If you travel the world, undoubtedly, you would know this to be true. In fact, if you earn $10,000 a year, like if that was your annual income, you would be in the top 15% of wage earners in the world. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. $10,000 a year, that puts you in the top 15%. Average American income is like $50,000 a year. So if that's your household income, $50,000, that puts you in the top 1% of wage earners in the world. And I mention this because sometimes when people hear that we've been blessed to be a blessing, they can insert somebody else to say, well, so-and-so, they've been blessed to be a blessing. 
But I want to dispel that kind of thinking. If you're sitting in this room this morning, you have been blessed to be a blessing. And when you understand the world in that way, you actually develop extraordinary faith by understanding I have been blessed, I can bless others, and I get to see God do extraordinary things as I live that out. And here's what we know. As we look at our narrative this morning, if we think about Jesus and what he shares and what he has to say, so in his king's speech in Matthew chapter 5, which is basically the king's speech, Sermon on the Mount is what we would usually refer to it as, king's speech, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, lots of teaching in there. And here's why. So I want to point out a scripture as to why we can have extraordinary faith in living out that we've been blessed to be a blessing. Matthew chapter 6, 25 through 32, he says, this is what I tell you, why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Are you? Absolutely, because you're made in his image. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that they are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. Why can we live out our faith as we're blessed to be a blessing? Because we know God has our needs covered. Now, that's not to say he has all your wants covered, but he will have all your needs covered. And I think where we get into trouble in an American setting is we want all of our wants covered. Okay, that's not in here. He knows all your needs. And if you're understanding that, to say, God's got it. So I can live with extraordinary faith and live out that I've been blessed to be a blessing. And as you do that, your faith grows. So I would ask the questions, are you managing your resources in such a way that they serve as a blessing to others? When you see needs, do you meet needs? We've been talking about that. Have you become a kingdom builder? Shelly talked about that in the offering this morning. As we head into our missions conference, we'll talk about that again and say, here's what we can do as we're blessed to be a blessing, to touch the world. Planting a church in Iraq, providing water wells in the DR, setting up a health clinic in Tibet. It's incredible today in the world that we live in how this church can absolutely touch the world. And not just the world that exists here in West Lafayette, but getting with and partnering with boots on the ground to touch the world. You can cultivate extraordinary faith by believing you have been blessed to be a blessing. And you can cultivate extraordinary faith by believing that you are third. You can cultivate extraordinary faith by believing that you are third. Maybe you're asking the question, what does that mean? And I will explain. We find in our narrative that the centurion was a humble man. With humility, his humility, it allowed others to honor him as a worthy man. With Jesus en route, he understood that God owed him nothing. He didn't feel worthy to be visited by Jesus. And at the same time, he understood the compassionate nature of Jesus and his authority and power to heal. He believed Jesus could heal by a simple, sovereign word, even from a physical distance. And it was this faith and humility in approaching God's power that Jesus says, this man has extraordinary faith. We need to cultivate the same kind of faith. God owes us nothing yet he extends his compassion to us. God honors us with his grace, not because we deserve it, but because he cares. And just as Jesus can heal from a distance 2,000 years ago, guess what? He can do it today. He sits at the right hand of God the Father, but as we pray at the end of the service today, we're going to pray for healing. Why? Because it, Jesus is not bound by time or location. His power and authority exists everywhere. So we're going to pray for that. Our youth area, if you've not been up there, it's named the third place. Why? Because God is first, others are second, and you are third. Tell me, does the centurion live this way? Does he? Absolutely. He knows who Jesus is and says, I'm not even worthy to be in your presence, but I know you have the power to heal, so please do it. I think of others in such high regard, I'm going to pay for their synagogue and be respected in this community. So he lives and is a great example of what it means to be third. So there's this movement, I am third, and so that's what we're talking about, that you can live with extraordinary faith as you live like that. You put God first, others second, and yourself in third place. So you believe you're third as you show respect to others and as you live generously. You can cultivate extraordinary faith by believing you are third. 
And lastly, this morning, you can cultivate extraordinary faith by believing in Jesus. Despite all of the centurion's respect for others and his generosity, this man still needs to believe in Jesus. He respects others, he lives generously, but he still needs faith in who Jesus is. And maybe this describes some of you in the room today. You live a good moral life, you are generous, but you still have not, you have not put your faith in Jesus. But just as this centurion was led to a place of putting his faith in God, you need to do the same. Here's what's interesting. So the centurion tells the, the elders, can you go and ask Jesus if he can heal this person? But somewhere between him asking the Jewish elders to go and do this, and before Jesus comes, what does he say? Lord, do not trouble yourself. So before Jesus comes to this man's house, he has somehow come to faith in who Jesus is, Jesus as Lord. We've got to put our faith in him. The centurion was a great man, a respecter of others, a blessing to the community he lived in. But here's what I want you to walk away with. Jesus is the greater centurion. The centurion's job was to go into battle and as necessary, lay down his life that others might live. The centurion could go as a substitute to die in their place to secure their freedom. But Jesus is a greater centurion. He is God come into human history. He is God at war against Satan's sin and death. He is God who comes not just leading a hundred, but now billions of people who believe in his name. Jesus is the greater centurion. And as the centurion was concerned about his one servant, so Jesus is concerned with each and every person in this room. He's a greater centurion. I, and I want you to see, so men in this room, I want you to see the centurion. Picture him in your mind for a moment. Probably with scars on his face and on his hands because he's battle-tested. He, he's a captain. He's strong. A man's man overall. He's a tough guy. He gives orders and young men are willing to die. This is who the centurion is. But now he looks at Jesus. In fact, he, he can't even look at Jesus. And here's what he says. You're the boss. You're in charge. You're a greater warrior than I am. Jesus is the greater centurion. That's the Jesus that we call men to. That's the Jesus we believe in. But not only is Jesus the greater centurion, Jesus is the better servant. The centurion loved the servant because he was humble, faithful, and dependable. Jesus, we're told in the Bible, he's a suffering servant. When we were leading the uh, international church in Jerusalem, we went through the gospel of Mark, and we focused on Jesus as our suffering, conquering king. Because Jesus is a greater servant. Jesus serves better than anyone else. He suffers and he doesn't leave his duties. He goes all the way to the cross in service to us. So when we suffer, we can go to Jesus who has suffered and he serves us as we're suffering because he knows what it is to suffer. And when we die, Jesus still serves us because he's been through death. He meets us on the other side. He wipes away every tear from our eye and he gives us eternal life where death and sin are no more because he has the victory. Jesus is the better servant. So you can cultivate extraordinary faith by believing in Jesus, the greater centurion and the better servant. So how can you cultivate extraordinary faith? Here's what we looked at this morning. You can cultivate extraordinary faith as you live third, by respecting others, by living generously, and putting your faith in Jesus. That's what we're talking about today. You have extraordinary faith by living third. Faith in Jesus, you serve others, you bless others, you live a generous life, and you respect them. So what we're going to do today is, as I already mentioned, we're going to close in prayer today. Why? Because we're looking at a passage of extraordinary faith. And we serve the God who heals. And so we want to pray for that today. So I'm going to, in a moment, invite the prayer team up here so that if you're in need of prayer this morning, be that physical healing, spiritual, emotional, we want you to be prayed for. Because God's desire is to make you whole. Again, sin, death, suffering, that was not the plan of God. His plan was wholeness. In fact, when God sent Jesus his son, he says, peace on earth. Peace means wholeness. His desire is for you to know wholeness. So we want to pray for that today. So some of you are here today and you're in the position of the servant. You're hurting. You're suffering. It's a very difficult time for you and so you need to be prayed for. And some of you are like the centurion and someone you love is suffering and they need to be prayed for. So you need to come and stand in for them and be prayed for this morning that they might know who Jesus is. So if we could stand as we're going to close in prayer this morning. As we're standing, prayer team, if I could ask that you come forward so that you can pray with people today. 
as we close out. So feel free to line up here in the front, and we're just going to pray with people today as we close. And we're going to close in song. But before we get into that prayer time today, I do want to ask, maybe you're here today, and the reason you've lacked extraordinary faith is because of the last part. You've never put your faith in God. And that really is a starting point. For you to have extraordinary faith, you need to know Jesus as the Son of God. But maybe you're here and you say, you know what, I need to live in a life that has faith. And so I want you to walk out of this place full of faith today. So if you'd say, that's me today, I desire to walk out of here with extraordinary faith, and so I know to do that, I've got to put my faith in God. With every head bowed in this room this morning, if I could just ask that question so I could pray with you before you go. If you're here today and say, that's me, I need faith in God. I I have been living for him, or maybe I, I have, but I've walked away from him. And you'd say, I need that faith today. If you just want to raise your hand, I want to pray with you before we go. Anybody here that say, I need to put faith in God today? Over here in the middle, anybody else? I need faith in God today. Over on the right, anybody else? Over here in the front and the right, two in the front right. Anybody else that say, I need faith in God today? I need to live with extraordinary faith. Over here on the left, anybody else? If you're looking for faith, you know that that's what I need to put my faith in today. I need to know Jesus as the greater centurion. I need to know Jesus as the better servant. We want you to have opportunity to do that today. So for those that raise their hand, I want to give you first opportunity to meet with the prayer team this morning. There was at least five of you. So I want you to be prayed for, because here's what we want you to do. We don't want you just to say yes to Jesus right now, and that's it. We know following Jesus is a lifetime endeavor. It's long obedience in the same direction. So we want to give you a Bible and say, here's where you go from here. So as we come forward and, and asking people if you need prayer for healing this morning, we want you to come forward. But if you made a decision to follow Jesus this morning, would you be willing to come to the front? Could we just cheer them on this morning as you come and meet with our prayer team? We want you to be prayed for first. If you said yes to Jesus today, I need to put my faith in you. Please don't walk out of this place without having met with somebody. Feel free to come down to the front because people are going to start filing out. As we get into song today, if you're in need of healing, come meet with one of the individuals down here that you can be prayed with. If you are the centurion today and you have somebody that you love dearly that needs prayer for, come down and get prayed for today. Can we do that? So let's sing, but let's pray.